inside women because your primary relationships are not only with one another, but also mostly with powerful white men and women in situations that many of us don't get to experience. We want you to talk about stories from your experiences along that line. I had a whole series of questions, but I think the simplest way to go about this is to have you focus on individuals and how you related to them. So let's start with Reverend Jackson. Many of the, the reporters and editors in this room have first-hand experience covering him over the years. Uh, I was working with AP when he ran for president in 1984, for example, and there are a lot of other people who wrote on the bus. Tell us about your experiences with Reverend Jackson and how he was a mentor to you. Well, I, I thought Jack went someplace. Yep. <laughs> 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 who followed us at 88? <laughs> I haven't seen you in a million years. Oh, Good to see you. <laughs> and first of all, thank you so much for inviting us. We're, it's an honor to be here. Um, but one of the things we wanted to do when we decided to write this book was to give tribute to Reverend Jackson for all that he has, has done. And I don't think anybody has ever told the story about the 84 and the 88 campaigns uh, the way we have in this book. You know, it was up close and personal and, you know, we all played major roles. Uh, John was involved in 84. Uh, Mignon and I were involved in 88. And it was just, it, it was amazing. It was an amazing experience. I don't, you know, it, it, it was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. Um, we were able to touch so many people and I, you know, I don't, I don't know that, his sto that this story will ever be told about the people that stand on his shoulders that, that came along after he won, I mean, after he ran. Um, there was a point in time where, and I think it was at 84 maybe, between 84 and 88, that there was a black mayor in charge of every major city, every major urban city, um, in America, and that, that all came after that. I can remember 1984, um, I, did, I wasn't working for the campaign, I was working for the DNC. And I was, this was the first camp, the first convention I worked, actually worked on. And I was the, wet, the whip for the East Coast region from the DNC. And I, I'll never forget that night. After he gave his speech, people were just you. They were jubilated. I mean, you know, people were going around since they were playing love train. And everybody was walking around you know, saying love train. They were hugging each other and kissing each other. And I remember talking to Bill Gray, the late Bill Gray, and he said to me, he says, I'm gonna run for budget chairman. If Jesse can do this, I can do this. And so many people did the same, there were so many elected officials that did, did the same thing afterwards and said, Jesse can do this, I can do this. And it was it was like a I don't know I don't know if you want to call it a Renaissance period where we had all these black people in office and then it kind of you know went down but now it's starting to come back and it's beautiful it's a beautiful thing to see I see all these women running for office and I think that is really something that Hillary unleashed you know people were very disappointed by her women went losing and they just decided that they were going to get out in the line. So it, it's like a new day. We've got a whole new generation in here. We've ushered a whole new generation. And I think they're going to come in and they're going to kind of take over, which I'm happy for because I'm ready to retire. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, a, you know, it's, it's, it's a great, it's a great, you know, we're, we're in a good place, I think. Not, not quite where we want to be, but I think, we, you know, we made a lot of accomplishments on this, uh, this midterm election. I mean, to get back to house, that is huge. I actually uh, worked for Reverend Jackson in, um, in 88 on the campaign side, but I came to him, um, I was actually in college and I was uh, doing a paper and the paper was called When Blacks Become Mainstream, Do We Lose Our Identity? And I was trying to get an interview with him, but I ended up getting the interview with Reverend Barrow, who was really one of the main architects behind Reverend Jackson. 
And at that time, I was working with her. I was actually working for Encyclopedia Britannica. And so the people that are in this room are old enough to know what Encyclopedia Britannica is. When I the young people, I didn't tell them. I didn't tell them it's not Google. It was not an amp. They don't know what it is. So I was working for Encyclopedia Britannica at the time, and I started volunteering for it. And um, she said, well, you need to put your good paying job. Well, but you, you need your health care. And I'm like, well, this is a nonprofit. So anyway, I went. But I ended up working for the campaign, and it was really a wonderful experience for a young adult to be able to do that because what it allowed us to do was play at the highest levels in campaigns. And Reverend Jackson just didn't open the doors for campaign operatives and political operatives. He actually allowed us to see professionals. My first experience with a Secret Service person was a black Secret Service person. His lead was an African American. My first experience with a pilot was an African American. And that came out of Reverend Jackson's campaign. And I do think that, you know, and I was thinking about this the other night, Connie, when I saw all of you beautiful women on the stage with Barbara. One of the things that I think, and you all are journalists, is that the history is kind of, it goes from Dorothy Hyde, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, and then there's a gap. And we haven't, there's so many stories in here probably that we haven't told. So I think when we started writing this book, we kind of fell into the book but we started looking at our own personal history, and we see that there's a yearning for young, with young people, and so I'm glad we pinned it. It's not, you know, it's not the end of history, it's not the beginning of history, but it is a slice of history that people probably have forgotten that you all wrote about, and so we hope that it becomes a reminder, and it's a good reminder for young people because they did not know that Reverend had accomplished anything because we jumped from you know, the Clinton era to the, uh, to President Obama, and so all the rest of that has been erased. So that's kind of, you know, my, my take on it, and I'm happy we did it. Talk about Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama starting out as collaborators and allies. So she supported the senatorial aspirations, then they became rivals, yeah. and how you were that's her story. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, when, you know, I'm from Chicago, obviously, and for those of us that are from Chicago in this room, I, um, I did not work with then the senator uh, when he was coming through as a state senator, but I knew of him. And so I got a call from uh, Hillary Clinton one day and said, you know, listen, I would love for you and some of your friends to meet with this new senator who's running for Senate because I think he is taxed we need him in the Senate, we want him in the Senate, and can you all get together? So Donna and I met with him and one of his colleagues in, in, our white, uh, in, our, in my office, and that's when we, we began our journey of just trying to help him become Senate, but we didn't just stop there. When we knew that this, this guy, this guy from the south side of Chicago had something special, we also recommended him to John Kerry to become the keynote speaker. And very few people know that the architect behind that was a group of black women, including Alexis Herman and Bill Lynch, who said, you know, this, this young man can do this. And so that's how we got started. But it was really Hillary's push. And then, of course, as the story is written, <laughs> they, they became rivals. But uh, they weren't rivals in a sense that we, we kind of see some of the politics today, because as soon as the campaign was over, we all doubled down and began to work for him, but there were a lot of heels and bumps that were written about, and one particular, you know, heel and bump that was written about, I mean, it's, it's in the book, was in South Carolina, when uh, President Clinton apparently was accused of being racist, and I was actually there, and I was there when I knew, I saw the whole story unfold, and I saw the questions that were being asked, but what the, what the press never wrote about was the night before, before that statement was even made, when he was sitting in an auditorium and some African American guy got up and said, Well, I you know, I love the senator. I think he's a wonderful guy, but I just don't believe America is ready for him. And so instead of President so <laughs> President Clinton, he said point blank, Well, I disagree with you. And instead of him just saying, I disagree with you, because he's there for his wife, they were in the middle of a campaign, he gave a full throttle speech on why President Obama was the right person at that time and that he could possibly win this election. And so the staff was looking at President Clinton like, 
Hmm. So you know you just won the state for President Obama. You see, those kind of those details, were, they never unfolded. And so we, I made some of that stuff out, not to embarrass any particular campaign, but to tell the whole story. And so then we get to, I think by the time we got to the end of the campaign, it was good for everybody. It was certainly good for President Obama, because I think it just opened him up fully. And he became a spectacular candidate against his, his, his rival opponent. So there you have it. And I think you should, you should talk about your relationship with Hillary Clinton, why uh, many black people have reservations about her, mm -hmm. whether you think those reservations are warranted, and whether there are things about her that we should know the definite. Well, I can. I, I, I first went to Hillary Clinton when I worked with Reverend Jackson, and we had gone to uh, Little Rock to do an event, church event. So we were doing our event on one side of town, and Bill Clinton and Senator John Kerry were doing the Jefferson Jackson dinner on the other side of town. And we knew we were competing. Um, at the end of our event, we went over to their set <laughs> and just showed up and Jesse went up on stage. And then we wound up going back to the governor's mansion um, with Bill Clinton. And we were, John, John Kerry, there was a John Kerry from Nebraska. Yeah. John Kerry from Nebraska. Bob Kerry. Bob Kerry. Bob Kerry, Bob Kerry, thank you. Bob Kerry from Nebraska uh, was there because he was the keynote speaker at the dinner. So we're all hanging out at the governor's mansion, and uh, Bill Morton, who we, we lost um, in the plane crash with Ron Brown, was there because he was working with Jesse at that time. And we just sat down, we were sitting down there just talking, like talking about politics and everything. And it was probably about 3 o'clock in the morning, and Hillary came down and said, okay, Y'all can continue this, but you got to go someplace else. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, ooh, a woman after my own heart. I love her. <laughs> She's in charge. <laughs> so she put us out. <laughs> and we, we went home, which we needed to do. Uh, but she, you know, I've, 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 got, I've gotten to know Hillary over the years. And I just think, I think she's probably one of the smartest people I've ever met. And I, I just think she would have made a brilliant president. I think she would have been the best president, one of the best presidents we've ever had so far, if she could have pulled this off. Wasn't a great candidate, didn't like that stuff. I get it, I don't like that stuff either. So I feel for her. But she was a brilliant woman and she could have made an amazing president and we wouldn't be in this mess that we are in right now. <laughs> Well, I actually met Hillary through a group of black women, uh, Marion Ray Elderman and Maya Angelou and a few others when she was at a dinner. And she started out at the Children's Defense Fund, and one of our dear friends, Maggie Williams, was working with her uh, during that time. But uh, I got closer to her as we, as I, when I worked at the White House. And one of the things that I think is very, she is, you know, I think people see a lot of things, and this is indicative of when you're looking at either a very a highly qualified woman or, you know, I try not to use the word strong woman because that then that sets us apart. So the Norwegian told me that they don't use the word strong, just women. So women. But anyway, she, you know, she's very smart, she's very capable. And she, what she suffers from, I think, a lot is she is just like a double down, get it down kind of gal. She's not, you know, now if, you, if it was like us just sitting in this room and just having this conversation, she would be brilliant at it. But it's when she gets out of these bigger forms that, you know, the unsteadiness gets out there. And you see what people have mostly observed is this kind of steady person that doesn't feel like she feels anything when in fact she feels probably more than most of us will ever, ever know. She's probably been through more than we will ever experience on a national level, good and bad. And so, you know, getting to know her, I think, is a part of her journey. And unfortunately, in a campaign, you just don't have that time. You know, and now that it's so instant, you either gotta, you know, you gotta be aspirational and you gotta draw people in very quickly, you gotta draw their emotions in, and. And if you can't do that, you got to sound bite it. Then people just say, oh, she's boring, she's this, she's that. And they really don't really look behind the scenes. I tell you, there, 
And she doesn't even like to hear me say this. She's very, she's much smarter than President Clinton. Oh, much smarter. Sharon's there. She can tell you. Sharon's, Sharon's been around. She was our White House photographer. I didn't mean to point you out, Sharon, but she was. And she was in all these intimate settings with them. She knows this woman is just simply brilliant, and she's going to bring great brilliant for this country. But so he was a vital politician. Yes, he was. Yeah. yeah. But so much of what we evaluate our politicians on is our emotions and not their ability to do it. What should people who want a progressive to be elected president in 2020 to be doing now. And are you all on Team Hillary for 2020? No, I, think Hillary, I don't think Hillary's going to run in 2020. Minneapolis know better than me, but I don't see her running in 2020. And, and I was like, uh, the, the, we're kind of at the point right now, we've been in this so long, we want to be courted. <laughs> well, I don't. I don't, don't tell me because I, 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 I want to be more. I have not going to jump on with anybody in the yeah. yeah. And I and I think that the, I think we're about to see the most diverse presidential election that we have ever seen in history. There will probably be four African Americans running, at least a couple of Hispanics that I can kind of attest to at this point. Several women. And I say the old white guys and the young white guys. And we may have the first uh, gay president that's, that's out. Well, um, nominee. Well, nominee, 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 yeah. 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 So it, it, it will be, people complain because they had, didn't, have, didn't feel they had choices last time. You're going to have so many choices this time. <laughs> 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 so I think it's a great thing. Yeah. I, I think it's a great thing. She's just great I think it's a great thing. You know, and I think that it'll, it'll, all, it'll all, you'll figure it out early. If they're not going to go the distance. I disagree with that too. I, I think, <laughs> okay. Well, actually, let me let me just say this before we get the hook. Uh, really? <laughs>